On December 21st, the night sky lights up with a close alignment of planets Jupiter and Saturn. The conjunction may also be a rare glimpse of what the Star of Bethlehem may have looked like. When you start talking about a scientific explanation for what the Christmas star may have been, to many believers, there's evidence that there really was a Christmas star. Well, did you have any doubts that there was? I mean, it's in Scripture. Don't you believe what Scripture says? What was the Christmas star? Well, before I answer that question, we really need to strip away some of the misconceptions we have about the birth of Jesus. It's only recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, and many of the impressions we have or memories we have or understanding we have of the birth of Jesus really come from Christmas cards, Christmas songs, and those endless Sunday school pageants with bathrobe-clad boys running around. Let me show a few images to you. Try to identify some of the things that really are not found in Scripture. For instance, this first one, well, you're seeing here a depiction of Mary and Joseph heading toward Bethlehem. We know that much, right? Is there anything else that you notice that isn't really found in Scripture? Well, there's no star yet, right? That's, that's the most obvious one. There's something else that's kind of subtle. Notice that Mary's riding a donkey, right? Was there a donkey mentioned? No. In fact, we know from the sacrifice they gave later at the temple they gave a poor man sacrifice. There's a very good chance they didn't even own a donkey. So how do you suppose Mary got from Galilee down to uh, Bethlehem? She probably walked. It doesn't look so nice on Christmas cards, but that's the way we, we do things. How about this one? This is a nativity scene. You probably have a nativity scene much like it at home. What do you see on the right? The wise men, right? <laughs> And they didn't come till later, didn't they? Were there three of them? We don't know. We know there are more than one because the plural is used, but it might have been eight or ten of them. And also, they're in a stable. Now, does the Bible indicate that Jesus was born in a stable? No, it doesn't. We infer that from the fact that there was a manger there. But many scholars think that actually the birth took place in maybe a storage area or a storage room of a house. And while going through these, I couldn't pass this one up. Three wise men and not one of you brought chocolate. <laughs> Having said that, kind of maybe called you to question some of those impressions you've had probably your entire lives. We have to ask the question, what does the Bible actually say? Well, the account of the Magi and the star is only found in 12 verses in uh, Matthew chapter 2. And in the first two verses, we have the account there of the Magi arriving in Jerusalem. And they uh, ask, where is this king born of the Jews? Because we've seen his star in the east. And then you had a reaction from King Herod. King Herod was paranoid. So when you have foreign dignitaries coming, very important men coming and asking about the birth of this new king of the Jews... That really set Herod off. Now, he called the, the, the wise men together and wanted to talk to them and ask them more intently about the information. The scribes were to tell them that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, about six miles to the south. So he then sent the Magi off. Remember, he told them, when you find him, come back and report to me so I too may go worship him. And of course, if you know much about what happened, is his intent was to kill the child because he, uh, again, as I said, was paranoid. And so the Magi were told in a dream, revealed to them the plot that Herod had, and so they returned a different way. They probably went down to Jericho and back up that way. Well, the Magi are very important figures in this whole thing, so we have to ask the question, who were they? And the King James actually translated this as wise men. Oftentimes we will say the three wise men. Sometimes we'll say Magi. This uh, group of people called the Magi is of Persian origin. In ancient times, Kings often had advisors like this. They raised up people who were very smart, trained them, and educated them everything they needed to know in order to assist. Beyond that, people began to speculate just who this particular Magi may have been. Can you think of anybody who was uh, connected to the advising class to kings and royalty there in Mesopotamia? Anybody you can think of? Daniel. Yeah, it comes to mind very, very quickly, doesn't it? And if you're familiar with the book of Daniel, he and his three friends, they were selected and they were educated in everything worth knowing at that time, including the religions of Mesopotamia, but yet they remained true to their God in all of this, and God blessed them for it. Multiple times we see in the book of Daniel that that happened. So many have suggested, this is speculation, but I think it makes sense that the memory of Daniel probably lived on as a sterling example of one of the best of the Magi. They may have known about Daniel's 
prophecy of 70 weeks. You see, at the time that Jesus was born, people knew what the 70 weeks was all about, and they knew the birth of the Messiah was very close. People were looking for it. So it wouldn't be surprising if just the Hebrews were not the only ones, but some influence all the way back in Persia, because there were still Jews living in Persia at that time. If you go back to Genesis 1.14, one of the purposes given for the heavenly bodies is to be for signs. The Magi saw something in the sky, a star, they said, that caused them to go to Jerusalem to seek out this king born of the Jews. So we have to get the background on the, who the Magi were and what they were possibly expecting. We can t look at a few clues that Matthew includes in chapter 2 of his gospel. The first thing mentioned we have is in the second verse, and the Magi, when they got to Jerusalem, reported that they had seen his star in the east. And unfortunately, that raises some ambiguity right there because his star in the east can have three possible meanings. The first possible meaning, they may have seen it while they were in the east. Remember, Persia is to the east of Jerusalem. Another possibility is that they may have seen it in the eastern sky. One thing you probably know about the east is that the sun rises in the east. That's caused by the earth's rotation, and the whole sky seems to spin east to west. And so not only does the sun rise in the east, but the moon rises in the east, and stars themselves, most of them, rise in the east, move across the sky, and set in the west. So which did the Magi mean when they said they saw his star in the east? Did they mean they saw it while they were in the east? Did they mean they saw it in the eastern part of the sky? Or did they mean that they saw it as it rose? Well, frankly, we don't know. <laughs> Bible scholars have gone over the Greek on this, and as they've done that, they said these are the three meanings, and we don't know which one was meant. There's no indication, though, that it actually led them all the way to Jerusalem. That's a common misconception. In fact, there's an indication that they didn't see the star from the time they'd embarked on their journey over several months to get to Jerusalem until after they saw Herod. Another important clue is that no one in Jerusalem seemed to have seen the star. Or if they did, they didn't catch the significance of it. And that's important. The next time the star is mentioned is in verses 9 and 10. They've gotten instruction now where the Messiah is supposed to be born. It comes out of Micah. Apparently the Magi did not know about Micah's prophecy. In fact, Herod didn't know either. He had to call the scribes up to tell him. And they said it's supposed to be down in Bethlehem. They said, okay, fine, that's six miles south down the road. It says they saw the star when they left, and they rejoiced the fact that they saw the star. And that's my indication that they probably had not seen the star in some time. In fact, it goes on to say that the star went before them. In reality, the only leading that took place was on that relatively short trip from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem. It went before them, it said. And then another clue, and this I think is the most fascinating, the star, it says, stood over the place where the young child was. The fact that it's mentioned indicates it's something unusual. So if I stepped outside of my house and I could see there's a star over my neighbor's house across the cul-de-sac, and then I walked over to the edge of the yard and I looked and it was still over my neighbor's house, and I walked back in front of my house where I started from, and it's still over my neighbor's house, would you think that would get my attention? Yeah. So consequently, the point, the fact that this is mentioned indicates that it was something very unusual about this star. And again, all four of those things, all four of those factors, I think are going to be important in formulating what this object might have been and also testing the various proposals that people have had. And one of the most common suggestions over the years has been a conjunction. Now, what a conjunction is, is when two objects get together in the sky. Uh, I went to an um, annual eclipse, and that was a conjunction the sun and the moon got together in the sky. If they didn't get together, there's no way in the world there would be an eclipse. But you know, the moon is in conjunction with other things. It passes through the stars once a month, and as it does, it has a conjunction with this star and that star. And the planets as well. The moon comes in conjunction with them every month, plus the planets as they move through the stars due to their orbital motion around the sun and our orbital motion around the sun. 400 years ago, Johannes Kepler, the famous German astronomer, saw a triple conjunction. What happened is Saturn's here moving along, Jupiter comes over, goes past it, and then they both go into what's called retrograde motion. They go backward, and Jupiter passed it a second time, and then Jupiter came back and passed it a third time. Now, a triple conjunction is pretty rare. And so when Kepler saw this 400 years ago, he got to thinking, how often does this happen? And he began running computations of it, and he found out they don't happen very often, but he noticed that one happened in 7 B.C., 
Now, even at that time, people had come to realize that the birth of Jesus was probably around 3 or 4 B.C. This is only three or four years before that. Kepler himself didn't think it was this triple conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. As, as unusual as it was, he didn't think that was what the star was. Instead, he suggested that it was a presage. It was kind of a thing heralding a nova. That is a star that suddenly brightens up where there was no star. So his, he was of the theory that it was a nova that took place. More recently, in the last 15, 12 or 15 years, there's been a lot of concern circling around a series of conjunctions between the planets Jupiter, Venus, and the star Regulus a few years later, between 3 and 2 B.C. And this was in the constellation Leo. And for some people, that, that makes a lot of significance because Leo is a lion, and Jesus is known as the Lion of Judah. And the star Regulus, it's the brightest star in Leo, and we get the word regal from the same root for this. It's called a royal star, and Jesus is royalty. So well, people say, wait a minute, you got this triple conjunction of the uh, king planet and this female planet, Venus. In uh, Constellation Leo, uh, this is a lot coming together here. But there's one, one big problem that I can see in this because for a very long time, historians have been convinced that Herod died in 4 BC. Herod would have been dead by the time this came along. Now to fix this problem, there is a uh, suggestion that Herod actually died in 1 BC, not in 4 BC. Uh, however, I don't know of any historians who've actually endorsed this idea. As far as historians are concerned, Herod died in 4 BC. And if that's the case, then this whole argument put together begins to fall apart. Now, I do remember that they're talking about the star of Bethlehem returning. Remember that talk? And it was about another conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn this time. The one in 2020 wasn't quite as close, but it was close. And here's a photograph I took. So there we have actually a star, two stars, and there was a jet plane that drove by. Unfortunately, it looks like a comet, but it's not. It's just the contrail of an aircraft bear. But the star on the left... The brighter wind, that is Jupiter, and the one on the right is Saturn. There have been various other explanations. Uh, nova or supernova, this kind of overlaps with what Kepler thought. There was a supernova, I think, recorded around 12 BC, and some people suggested that might have had something to do with it. Another suggestion was a comet. Comets uh, come and go. We don't have any records of any comets around 4 or 3 BC, about the time Jesus may have been born. But on the other hand, not every comet would have been recorded necessarily. And other people suggested lunar occultations of bright stars or planets. A lunar occultation is when the moon passes in front of a star or a planet. And then some people just suggested it was pious fiction, that Matthew simply heard about some star or supernova or a comet or something and just kind of folded that into his account of the birth of Jesus. And you should recognize that as being a direct assault on the authority and inspiration of Scripture. Okay, what are the difficulties with these natural explanations? Well, any celestial object, I've already alluded to this earlier, tends to move east to west, rises in the east, sets in the west. As you travel from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, you're heading southward. Instead of moving ahead of you in a southward direction, it's going to be going from east to west due to the daily motion, and so it's going to tend to go from left to right, not straight before you. Also, it would not be continually visible. It would rise each day or each night. It would set, and then the next night you might see it or not, but it's going to not be continually visible for any length of time. But finally, this is a kicker for me, how could it stand over the place where Jesus was? You see, no natural astronomical object can make that work. The other problem is you're looking for a natural explanation, yet for the reasons I just gave you, a natural explanation doesn't fit Matthew's account at all. So if it's not a natural phenomenon, then what does that leave? It leaves a supernatural sort of thing, right? What if God specially made a light in the sky that was maybe a few hundred or a few thousand feet up? You know, it would only be visible over a small geographical area. If we flew this thing over top of the Creation Museum, people a mile or two away would not, wouldn't necessarily see it. So it would be visible to only a few people. That would explain why maybe nobody in Jerusalem happened to see it, because they were hundreds of miles away. But then when they saw it again, again, it was a few miles south of Jerusalem, perhaps, and maybe nobody in Jerusalem even saw it. Maybe it was a personalized sort of thing. And this then makes this not repeatable. Now, if something's not repeatable, then you can't really analyze it scientifically because repetition is very important in science. Otherwise, it's a one-off, a miraculous sort of event. 
And it would be consistent then with what Matthew's account in chapter 2 of his gospel tells us. We have to keep in mind that there's a lot of miraculous stuff about the birth of Jesus. For instance, he was virgin born, never happened before, hasn't happened since, it's not going to happen again. That was a unique event, folks, a miraculous event. And there were miraculous signs that accompanied his birth before, during, and after. You know, I think when you start talking about uh, science, uh, scientific explanation for what the Christmas star may have been, to many believers, it's confirmation. You know, ah, there really is proof. There's evidence that there really was a Christmas star. Well, did you have any doubts that there was? I mean, it's in Scripture. Don't you believe what Scripture says? So it works both ways. A natural explanation can certainly encourage the faithful, but for the people you're trying to reach, it's not going to work at all because it was just a natural thing that happened. I don't think it really promotes it very well at all. So that's the reason why here at Answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum, we like this miraculous uh, sort of explanation rather than a natural sort of explanation. 